policies that would depress the economy, then Argentina was a net loser. And so the president of Argentina stood strong and firm and succeeded eventually in getting an agreement with the creditors. And meanwhile, the economy managed to grow. Now, some people say, say that this shows the current arrangements work. We don't need a way of systematically dealing with bankruptcy. But I think just the contrary. What Argentina showed that you need an enormous amount of resolve, forceful, forcefulness, and confidence to be able to stand up to international institutions and international creditors and do what Argentina did. Most countries have neither the confidence in themselves or the strength to go ahead and do it. And a long protracted bargaining process has enormous costs. No country leaves the relationship between creditors and de debtors within their country merely to a matter of bargaining. There are bankruptcy laws, bankruptcy courts, to deal with this very difficult situation that arises, an unpleasant situation which arises, when somebody who's borrowed money can't repay it. And we need an international mechanism for dealing with this situation at the international level. There is, in fact, broad agreement about this, uh, this idea. Even the IMF has recognized it. Unfortunately, the Bush administration in the United States has put a major roadblock. And one of the aspects of the democratic deficit in globalization is that the United States has an effective veto power. It says, we don't need another bankruptcy regime. All we need to do is make a slight change into the contracts, debt contracts, what are called collective action clauses. Collective action clauses to make sure that no single creditor can hold up all the other creditors for ransom. Yes, those collective action clauses are important, but they're not, they will not suffice. The UK has collective action clauses in most of its debt contracts, and yet it still needs and has an effective bankruptcy law. Designing an appropriate bankruptcy law is not easy. One has to balance debtor interest and creditor interest, and it's part of the political process by which that is done. But in my mind, what is clear is that we do need a new framework for dealing with these debts the unfortunate situation when countries find themselves unable to pay what they owe. Most importantly, going forward, we have to work to try to prevent countries from getting so much into debt that they can't repay. For the poorest countries, the answer I described before. Money given to these countries in assistance should be more in the form of grants less in the form of loans. For the middle-income countries, the problems are more complex. I described earlier that one of the reasons the problems have become as great as they have is that poor countries are forced to bear the risk of international volatility. They borrow in dollars, and they often borrow short-term, so that when interest rates vary or exchange rate vary, they are left to bear the burden. We need to try to create mechanisms that allow these countries to borrow in their own currencies or in currencies of countries related to them. There is actually an initiative of this kind going on in Asia, creating a called an Asia bond fund, where the countries of Asia could borrow in their own currencies or in related currencies that will make them less vulnerable to exchange rate variations between the dollar, the euro, and, and their own currencies. That would be a step in the right direction. The most important step in the right direction, of course, is for these countries not to borrow as much as they borrowed in the past. Asia managed in the past to avoid the problem by having high savings rates. And in fact, it was only after the 
U.S. Treasury and the IMF and the international community encouraged these countries to open up their capital markets, that they actually began to borrow significant amounts abroad and they became vulnerable. They didn't really need to borrow when they were already saving 25, 30, 35, 40 percent of GDP. And the irony was that at the same time they were borrowing, they were lending. But they were lending and borrowing in a way that left them exposed to the risk of this international volatility. The volatility of international lenders who might all of a sudden decide that they don't want to put their money in the country. So we have to recognize that inevitably there will be a lot of instability and vagaries in international financial markets and the developing countries need to rely more on themselves and increase their savings rates and be much more cautious in borrowing, especially borrowing in currencies of dollars, euros, and other foreign currencies, unless we find a way, a better way of stabilizing exchange rates, which no one so far has figured out. These are some of the things that countries can do the international community can do to reduce the burden of debt and to make sure that it won't recur in the future. This would be an important step in reducing the poverty in the developing world. But it is, as I say, only one of a raft of things that need to be done to improve the well-being of the poorest countries of the world. I think that we can think about this in, in a broad way of that we need to increase their opportunities, we need to increase their resources, and we need to increase their ability to use these opportunities and resources. Of course, the responsibility of using the opportunities and resources lies basically with the countries themselves. Good governments will be able to do it better. But the advanced industrial countries can help. Too often they have actually undermined the ability of, of the developing countries to deal with the problems. They've undermined democracy, undermined, uh, they've, they've contributed to the corruption. People often talk about bribery. But every bribe has two sides. There's a briber and the bribee. And unfortunately, too often the briber is from the advanced industrial countries. There has been progress. The United States passed what is called a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and then through the OECD, this was brought in, into all the advanced industrial countries. I was actually representing the United States at one of the critical ministerial meetings where, where this was negotiated. Unfortunately, there have been too few prosecutions under this anti-bribery legislation. And so cases still continue. And it's often extremely difficult to even detect it. Another problem that's well widely recognized is secret bank accounts. They play a vital role in facilitating corruption. Back in 19, 1997, when, when East Asia went into crisis, the IMF and the United States talked about transparency. They said, you have to make things more open, more transparent. And after a number of months of discussion, countries of East Asia came back and said, well, yes, we, we, we agree. But in order to trace all the flows of money in and out of our country, we have to know something about these secret bank accounts, these offshore banking centers, the Cayman Islands and other places. Why are people banking in the Cayman Islands? Not because the climate there is particularly good for banking, not because it's a great location for banking, but because they can, by banking there, can circumvent the kinds of regulations that 
Europe and the United States have broadly put into effect. It's not an accident that these institutions occur, exist. They could be stopped, but they are deliberately there as a way for wealthy individuals to avoid taxation, to avoid the regulations, corporations to avoid the taxations and regulations. The advanced industrial countries to the OECD put forward a, a proposal to reduce bank secrecy. Not to eliminate it, but to circumscribe its scope. Almost all the countries except the United States agree to it. That was in August 2001. The United States said, well, this is an important part of competition, even though a little bit earlier it had talked about the importance of transparency. But in September 2001, they recognized that bank secrecy could not only be used for tax evasion, corruption, but also to fund terrorists. And since then, they have shown that you can actually stop, control the flows of funds. You can control the funds for terrorists. What they need to do now is broaden the ambit of this to include money that is involved in corruption and tax evasion, which are costly to all countries, but particularly to developing countries. The net flow of funds from Africa and to many of these countries is out, and much of the money is out going out of the country is corrupt money. And so by breaking down this bank secrecy, opening it up to scrutiny, you would put a powerful force to discourage the kind of corruption and bribery that has too often existed in the developing countries. There are other things that need to be done. One of the important forces impeding development in many areas of the developing world is conflict. Conflict is fed by arms. People can't, the scope of conflict is very limited if they didn't have so many arms. But unfortunately, arms sellers, sellers make a good profit out of selling the arms, even though the cost to the countries on the other side is enormous. There needs to be a restriction on these arms sales. They should be stopped or at the very least taxed. Economists talk about this as an externality, a cost imposed by one party on others. And this is something that the advanced industrial countries could easily do and would it be of enormous benefit to the developing world. These are some of the ways that the advanced industrial countries could contribute to strengthen democratic governance, strengthen the capacity of developing countries to take advantage of the opportunities that are being afforded and to use the resources. A second part of the agenda is to make sure that there are more resources. I talked before about the importance of changing the way that aid is given, moving away from loans and making more of the assistance in the form of grants. But there also needs to be much more assistance. The countries of the world got together a couple years ago and agreed in Monterey, Mexico, to commit themselves to provide 0.7% of GDP to help the developing countries. It's not a lot of money, but it would make an enormous difference. And the developing countries have shown that they know how to use that aid for education, for health, for providing infrastructure, a host of needs that, the, the ways in which this money could be well used. Unfortunately, only a few countries have lived up to that commitment. The United States, the world's largest, richest country, is providing only about one-fifth of the amount that was pledged. 
The United States can clearly afford it. Today, it is spending more every year on Iraq. The war, such devastation. Then the whole world is spending on foreign assistance. So there's not a question of an ability to afford. If you can spend so much on death and destruction, clearly we, the United States can spend on creating new opportunities, doing something about the fertile feeding grounds on which terrorism feeds. Another way in which more resources could be given to developing countries is to make sure that they get paid fairly and fully for their valuable resources. I described before how this paradox of plenty, the resource curse, the fact that the countries with large endowments of resources too often do not do very well. Part of that has to do with the corruption, the bribery, the attempt of, of foreign companies to be able to get these resources at below market prices, that you can buy them more cheaply if you pay a government official than if you pay full prices. More transparency would expose this kind of corruption. Transparency that ensure that the oil and mineral companies disclosed how much they paid to the government how much they were paying for, for the resources that they were obtaining, what their costs were, would, ask, would enable developing countries and their citizens to ascertain whether they're getting a fair deal, whether something untoward going on. So this could too can make a very big difference. If they were getting paid fully for their resources, they would have, I believe, enormously more resources which they could use to enhance their development and growth. There are too many winners from globalization for us simply to walk away. But there are too many losers for us to continue with the status quo there will have to be changes. I believe we can use the forces of the market, the forces of globalization, to provide incentives to make globalization work better. I described how we can use the forces of the market and the forces of globalization in ways that will provide better incentives for the use of the environment. We can give incentives for the United States to restrict its emissions of greenhouse gases, we can provide incentives for the developing countries to maintain their force. So globalization and markets can provide incentives to make globalization work. We've learned these lessons in managing the market economy over the last 150 years. We've learned how to temper the problems of the market economy. We've learned how to make sure that the market economy's benefits go not just to a few people at the top, but are enjoyed broadly by society as a whole. We've learned that we have to regulate markets. There's an important role of government providing safety nets, an important role of government in supporting research, and developing new ideas, education, a whole variety of areas. We've striven to get a balance between the role of the market and the government. These lessons now need to, need to be extended to the way we run the global economy. We have a global society in which we become more interdependent. But we yet don't have a global system of dealing with the political consequences. And it is this gap between economic globalization and political globalization that is at the core of so many of the problems that we see with globalization today. I believe that not only is another world possible,
I believe another world is necessary. I know that economically this other world is possible. I know that on the basis of economics we can make globalization work. The issue today is one of politics. Can we use the forces of democracy? Can we close the democratic deficit? Can we get a narrow the gap between economic globalization and political globalization? If we can, then I believe that we can reshape globalization. We can make globalization work, not only for the rich and the richest countries of the world, but for the poor and the rich and the developed and the developing countries alike.